probably not a person in this room that would not agree in the fact that we all want peace. Yes. And that inner peace, um, peace with other people, peace in the world. <laughs> in the same way, you probably realize that probably also not a person in this room that doesn't realize that we're struggling to find that peace. That that peace is not existent in our world. And that we're at a, a intense moment with someone in our lives. Romans chapter 12, there's one verse in that chapter that if I were everyone in this room, I'd grab a highlighter and highlight it. So if you have your Bibles, would you open up to Romans chapter 12, verse 18? I think this verse is just incredibly helpful. If you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles in the back. We'd love for you to grab one. If you do it electronically, that's all cool. I like my old school Bible because I just write all over the place inside of it. And that's helpful to me because I come back to those verses later and find it. I know many of you can do that electronically. I put the verse up on the screen. I have this feeling like if somehow we could get this verse into our head and meditate on this all this week, just that alone would be life-changing when it comes to peace in our lives, when it comes to dealing with inten uh, intense, uh, intense relationships that we have. So let me just read it to you, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It's not easy. And for certain, as much as everyone wants peace, extremely countercultural. Love your enemies, forgive others. Quit the gossip. Believe the best in someone. Not what anyone is doing or suggesting when it comes to gaining that peace. Text says, if possible. <laughs> yeah. My scenario is it's not possible. And today, I'm just going to ask you to, let's go down the if possible route. Next week, we'll go down the impossible people route. Okay, so I'm going to come right back to this next week, and we're going to go down the impossible people route. Today, I want to go down the if possible route. So let's go there. And let me, let me just throw out some thought processes why I am very confident that this is possible. We're at chapter 12 of Romans. If you've been following with us since the beginning of the year, we started at chapter 1. And as we entered into chapter 1, Paul says, I would love to come to get together with you, um, the Roman people. I just want to share the love of God with you. We've already talked about the intense love of God. I want to share that with you. I want to talk with you about that. I want to have that relationship with you about that. And then he begins to go into this explanation about it where he explains, yeah, the problem with this and with each one of us is that as much as God is so attractive to us, we're separated from him because of our sin. And by the way, we are all sinners and we are all separated from him. But he is a big God and oh, what a good God he is and how much he loves us, but we're separated from him. That's, that's this ongoing message that we wrestled with for about six months in here. And then he says, he loves us so much that even though we're separated from us, he comes to us. And he teaches us how to live and he shows us the best way to live. And he begins to share about himself as the only way to live. And we hang him on a cross and crucify him. And in that moment, he cries out, Father, forgive them. He dies, but he doesn't stay dead. He comes up from that grave alive to bring new life to all who would be forgiven by him who would receive him into their lives, who would receive that forgiveness. And we're told that those who do that, they're actually brought into the family of God in a, a formal adoption way. They are made sons and daughters of the almighty God, given a place in his kingdom. They are transformed, they are renewed, never to be the same again. 
And chapter 12, where we are in these several weeks, starts out with these words, therefore, as a result of this grand thing that God, who we couldn't get to on our own, came to us, loved us so much, died for us, and offers us of life. And because we said yes to him and put our trust in him, if you've never done that, I would love to talk with you about that. If you've never done that, today's the day to do that. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. You don't have to be an outsider to that. He's inviting you in. He's in inviting you to relationship with him. There's a little card in the back of your chair. It says, I said yes to Jesus. Write your name on there. If you're like, I I didn't say yes to Jesus. I need to know more. Write your name on there. Get it to me. Leave it on your chair. Hand it to someone on the way out at the doors. We want to talk to you about that. When we say yes to Jesus, everything changes. And so chapter 12, he says, okay, from here on out, I'm going to talk about the practical realities of this. Because of the gospel... Here's the foundational principles of peace. Because there's peace in your heart between me and God, you and God. Now there can be peace between you and someone else. And here is the foundational principle. Christ's selfless love requires that I do my best for you. Because I understand the cross, because I understand that I didn't deserve that. It was a gift I didn't deserve. Remember, that's what grace is. That's our definition of grace, a gift that I didn't deserve. Because I got that gift that I didn't deserve because I was a sinner um, separated from God. I now give you that kind of grace. You, now that you understand that you got that gift, you give others that kind of grace. The problem is, We struggle to think of ourselves as bad. We think we've got it all dialed in. It's the other person that doesn't. And the irritating part is they think they have it all dialed in. We know they don't. And they think we don't. Bam! Peace exploded. The foundational principle is when I realize that I was so separated from God, I couldn't get to God. That's what we've been talking about for 11 chapters because he came to me and forgave me. I need to come to everyone else and give that same kind of selfless love for you. Second, foundational principle, based on the gospel, these first 11 chapters, what Christ did for me, I need to treat you the way God, through Christ, treats me. God, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, offers us peace. Me, because of what Christ did for me on the cross, I offer you peace. You, because of what Christ did for you on the cross, you offer me peace. That's the foundational principle. Now let's go back to the verse. Let's read that verse one more time. I'm going to put it up on the screen behind me. If possible, He wants us to know here these words. It is possible. And it's only possible because of Jesus. If you talk to anyone else in this world, they'll tell you peace is very elusive. Everyone's chasing after it. They want it. You talk to governments. You talk to nations. You talk to individuals. You talk to corporations. You talk to families. You talk to marital couples. I want, I want, I want peace. I'm looking for it. But just about the time you think you get it, someone behaves wrongly and that is just blown up and ruined and it's canceled. But because of the cross, we're told it is possible. I'm going to say it on just about every situation you're dealing with in your life. You need Jesus. It's the only thing that's going to bring that ultimate peace to your life. I need Jesus. And it is possible to have peace. Because through Jesus, you have peace. Next phrase says, so far as it depends on you. So I'm going to throw this out to you. There are some things I can do. And there are some things I can't do. To bring about this kind of peace. So let me talk about the things that I can't do. It's the thing that really sort of creates this into a fiery mess. I can't make another person be at peace with me. And there's some of you going, thank you. I, 
Because we know, we, we've tried, we've tried to be that person, we've tried to create that foundation of peace, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about creating a lifestyle of peace. Because if, if the cross is at the center of our lives, then there is a peace on us that exudes to everyone else we're talking to. Next week, I'm gonna talk about how do we make peace when everything's a mess? What I'm talking about right now, that we can't always make peace. I can't make another person be peaceful with me. Two, I can't fix another person. I know that what they need is the peace of Jesus in their heart. The reason why they're hurting so bad and the reason why they hurt us back so bad is because they don't have that peace of Jesus in their life. You say, well, they claim they put their trust in Jesus. They haven't let him be Lord of life, uh, Lord of their life and control them and give them that a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that only Jesus can give. And you can tell them that and normally that pff, fires things up all the more. You're going to have to wait until they get that somehow. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. You've got to just pray for them that they'll get that peace. By the way, it might be you and me that's hurting. And while we think the other person's the problem, we may be that hurting person where that peace is not in us. The peace of Jesus is not exuding from us. And so we have to really work on that. So again, today, our focus is how can I, and, and the focus is because of how the passage is laid out, and I'll show you this in a second. How can I live at peace with all so far as it depends on me? We said it's possible because of the gospel. What are some things that I can do? The reason why I'm convinced that this is what God's wanting to tell us today is because as I looked at this passage we ended with verse 8 last week, and if you start at verse 9 reading, you're going to see a list of things that just says, do this, do this, do this, do this, this, this. And when you go down through that list, you're going, okay, how do I communicate that to all of you? And why would you want to do all those things? And I'm sort of exhausted already. Think about it. Last week, we said, you have a gift. When you got saved, God gave you his Holy Spirit, and he gave you a very special God-fired-up God-inspired gift to use and be part of the kingdom with and do great stuff for the kingdom. And that's how we came out of last week's message. And we said, we want you to use that gift. And don't neglect that. It'd be crazy to neglect that. And then we turn around this week and go, okay, here's 50 more things to do. Actually, I think there were 24 in this list. But when we go down to verse 18, it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Here's what I observed. What comes before that and what comes after that explains how to do this. And in fact, verses 9 through 13 really tell us things that we can do to live at peace with people that we have relative peace with already. People that we like, people that we're comfortable with, people that are responding okay with. They're not the people we're already fired up with. Starting at verse 14, he talks about, what about those people that you're fired up with? We'll talk about that next week. And chapter 12, verse 19, it talks about some real specific things, what to do with those people to work through that. We're going to talk about that next week. Some just real, here's some heavy-duty peacemaking tips right from the Word of God on how to deal with those tough-to-deal-with people. Today, let's just talk about how to have a foundation of peace in our lives. The gospel is the foundational piece of that. If you have Jesus in your life, it changes everything. If Jesus is bleeding out from your conversation and from what you're talking about, it changes everything. Although I must say, when you talk about Jesus, that fires up some people just in itself. But at least you know that's why and you have the peace of Jesus in your life. Now, if we can right now, what I'd love to do is take you to chapter 12, verse 9. And I want to take you down just a short piece of this list that he explains. And I believe 9 to 13 gives us just a bunch of things how to have just a foundation of peace in our lives. The first one, it says this. It says, let love be genuine. That kind of love that it's speaking of here is agape love. It is a God kind of love. It is that self-sacrificing love where I put other people ahead of myself. When we read those words, genuine love, let love be genuine. We live in a world of, uh, that, that 
values highly authenticity. If I said in this room, yeah, we're a group of authentic people, everyone's like, oh, that's good. But the problem is, is that's a lot of times just a faux authenticity. It's a fake authenticity put on to look like we're authentic. But the reason why people are struggling is because everyone continues to look for the real thing. They're looking for genuine love. This is God's kind of love that is unconditional. I wrote, um, I, I, I mentioned earlier, I love writing in the margins of my Bible. And next to these verses 9 through 13, I wrote these words. I wrote, living for the benefit of others. See, God kind of love. Why would God leave heaven and send his son Jesus here to this earth to um, live among us and to be ultimately crucified by us? This is living for us, living for the benefit of others. A friend of mine uses the phrase, disadvantaging ourselves for the benefit of others. It's self-sacrificing love. Now, that's authentic. And you don't just throw a label on it and put it on a um, banner or on a wall or on the back of a business card. This is something that if you're doing it, it's real. If you're not doing it, you're not giving genuine God kind of love. By the way, the next three words in this verse say, abhor what is evil. And I struggled with that because I thought about this, that oftentimes when we abhor what is evil, we hate the evil that we see in someone else. I'm thinking that doesn't help in the peacemaking process. You know, um, if possible, so far as it depends on you, you're a sinner. <laughs> It doesn't really work well. All of a sudden, it dawned on me that to have this kind of genuine love, I need to be able to have a look inside of me. It's pulling up that mirror and seeing the evil inside of me and saying, I'm a sinner. I am wrong. What creates so much of the tension in our world is the quick look where we look and say, You are wrong, you are bad, and we like picking that out. And we haven't even looked in the mirror and said, here's my stuff. And so that would be a thought process in this when we're looking at trying to build peace and create this foundational of peace is what do I need to deal with in my own heart? Last week when we were talking about spiritual gifts, it talked about um, a soberness that we need to have with dealing with our gifts because we get puffed up and prideful that, you know, we've been given this amazing gift that God's Holy Spirit's given us. I mean, God himself gave us this, supercharged it so that we can serve um, God's people. And sometimes we, if we start using that, we can get puffed up on the inside. And so here, as we think about how we respond to people, if we're giving a God kind of love, we put the mirror up in front of ourselves and we say, hey, what's the real stuff that we're dealing with? The next phrase here is love one another with brotherly affection. So we just talked about agape love. This is talking about phileo love, Philadelphia love, brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. Don't you just feel the love when you go into the city? When I drive by that love sign, it's like, oh, I'm so loved here in Philly. Everyone's so kind and warm, and they just can't wait to help me and give me a hug, invite me in. That used to sort of irritate me. It's like, you know, if you're not going to change your ways, change your name. But the idea of brotherly love has to do with who your dad is. What makes us brothers is who our dad is. Which would explain why if you got a group of people whose father is the devil, which is what Scripture says, those whose father isn't God, their father is the devil, guess what their father deals in? Lies and deceit and deception and death. That would explain why... You're not feeling it there. But it reminds us of how we behave when we get together. It's that reminder of brotherly love because we have one father. Now, any of you that have kids? Are those kids just loving each other with brotherly love? How's that going? 
And yet, have you noticed there seems to be a point where that changes? Where all of a sudden they get a vision for that and it changes. Some of you look at me like, no, <laughs> sorry about that. I hope that it changes someday. But it does illustrate the, the, the tensions that we can even have within the church. We don't look at that and say, wow, I'm, I'm surprised at that. You have those tensions in your own family, raise these kids, they have the same blood, and they struggle getting along with each other. And in the church, oftentimes, we struggle that. We're just going to be honest with each other on that. The scriptures say we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, um, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The enemy, Satan, wants to get things mixed up in here, wants to bring death into our world, wants to bring separation into our culture. And he says here, Listen, I want you to be a people that love each other with brotherly affection. The next phrase says, outdo each other by showing honor. Now, there's, I have a friend who every time I come into his presence, he has a way of speaking several things about me where he just speaks honor over me. And I noticed that he has a way of doing that out loud in front of other people. And at first I thought, that's pretty cool. And then I noticed that he does that to everyone. And I thought, oh, I guess I'm not so special after all. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, that is way cool because he says different things about them than he says about me. He's showing honor. He's showing honor to all. I'm like... That is cool. And the fact that he does it in front of others. And here's something I noticed. Because of that, I started doing it to him. I saw things in him, and so I started honoring him. I've noticed that other people do the exact same thing to him. Is because he's doing it to them, they're doing it back to him. They're showing honor, and this honor thing just starts. It's like mushrooms. It gets bigger. And then it all of a sudden dawned on me. And I have this list of things that I'm, I'm working on at any given time. It, it's, it's a little a note on my, on my phone, these things that I'm working on. And this is one of those things is how can I, when I come into contact with you, speak something of honor to you and even in front of someone else that'll hear that so that that honor can um, grow and something different and something very unique and something very special to, to you. Outdoing one another in honor. Can you imagine if, if when you arrived at this place on a Sunday morning, if that's how people treated you and they noticed things and they noticed very specific things about you. It would even go back to the gifting um, that we talked about last week because even if we just began to show honor by recognizing the gifting of that person and we're, again, as a church, encouraging one another to love and good deeds. This next phrase that you'll see on the screen. You'll see the words um, zeal. It says, do not be slothful in zeal. Here's what I think that means, because it, it says, next, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, is that for some of us, we've gotten to a place where we don't think about God all week long. We once met him face to face, and we realized that he saved us from our sin. We once had experiences that we repeated where he's done awesome things in our lives, and we just couldn't wait to tell about it. We recognized that it was moving us along. We recognized God's spirit was lifting us up and carrying us along, and it is very, very, very easy to become slothful. That's an ugly word, isn't it? Sloth. Any sloths in here? I mean, to a place where we are lazy in, in not shouting out, constantly echoing the love of God in our lives, stating what he's done for you. Did you wake up this morning? Did you have a breath this morning? Did the sun come up again this morning? Is God still on his throne this morning? Then we have something to speak of and echo to each other about the intense love of God, let alone what he is doing in our lives today. And that begins to build a spiritual fervor. Again, when we gather among each other and we share that among each other, that has a build to it. And all of a sudden you start thinking, what did God do in my life today? Like, Whoa, he did do something. We, we just forget to look. It's fun being around those people that are looking and watching going, what's God doing? Where's God working? And when we see it, we repeat it to someone else. And guess what? They repeat it to someone else and they begin to say something that God's doing in their life and there's a build 
And then that last one there, serve the Lord. If you're struggling with someone, if you're struggling where there seems to be tension everywhere in your life, just start serving somewhere. Here's what I observe. Oftentimes we get into this mode and I too often accept it. And this is, this is how it goes. It goes something like this. Wow, I'm just at a moment in my life right now where things are really busy. This new job has me around the clock. I'm traveling a lot. And when I get home, I'm exhausted. And I still have to go, to go to the baseball game and go see the dance competition. And I just don't have time to serve right now. I really need to put my family out there. And, but I'm going to get back to it later on. But I hope you understand. And honestly, my response in that point is, yeah, I get it. I get it. That's cool. You know, you go do your thing. We'll be waiting for you when you get back. But what I find oftentimes happens is people get out of sync in that moment. Because quickly, serving puts us in a thing where I'm thinking about you. I'm disadvantaging myself for you or for someone else. I'm putting the needs of others first. That's agape kind of love. That's brotherly love, showing my love to the brothers. And all of a sudden, I start getting to me kind of love, what I need for me and what I can do for myself. And I begin serving myself. And I do that for a while. And pretty soon, guess what? I become me focused and all of a sudden that puts me at odds with you and I begin to have this kind of tension going on in my life. And so that's why he reminds us we need to be a kind of people that have that fervor of spirituality so that we have a zeal to serve so that serving doesn't stop. I'm just gonna tell you today, when I say to you, would you serve? I'm not asking you to serve because, oh no, things are falling apart in the kids' ministry. We didn't have any ushers today. Hey, there weren't any greeters at the door. Oh, there wasn't anyone to check in. That's not where I were asking you for that. I mean, it helps. It's cool. And we'd love to have everyone involved because it makes a huge difference. Um, it's nice to have people cutting bagels and serving in that way. But the biggest reason is because when you serve, it changes your perspective on life. It changes you. And as a result of it changing you, it changes your role in the church. And you become an active part of the body, which makes this place a beautiful place called the church that Jesus meant it to be. You're so quiet. <laughs> Just a couple more here. By the way, this is why I struggled looking at this at the beginning. Because like, which one do we start with? By the way, I'm going to tell you at the end, you just need to start with one. This is where I'm going to get to in just here in just a couple minute, moments. So be thinking about that. Next it says rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. If you haven't caught the definition of this yet, we've defined um, hope a number of times in the last few months, but I want to define it one more time. Certainty in what we do not have yet. There is a heaven coming. There is an eternity coming. There is something better coming. There is something more coming. There is more than this sinful world that is all churned up and at each other's throats. Hope. I need to be a person of hope. Thinking forward to something that's not yet um, arrived yet. A certainty in what is about to come. Our world is dying for hope. They can't have any peace because they have no hope because they've never turned to the cross. I've told you again, the thing that's going to bring about peace is Jesus. He is the prince of peace. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. Our friends need Jesus. And without Jesus, there is not going to be peace. But we need to be the purveyors of hope who know that there is a certainty beyond today. Hey, listen, if there is nothing more than today, if we have no hope, we are a desperate people. No wonder we turn on each other and start fighting. But when we have a hope, when we know there is a future, when we know this is all going somewhere, and it matters. It changes us. And somehow in that moment, we can get in this together. Looking ahead, the next phrase that is um, listed there says, patient in affliction. Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be a good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Patient in affliction, a hope, a certainty of the future. It changes us, and it changes the way people see us because all of a sudden, we're 100 pounds lighter, and some of you'd go for that today. Yeah. <laughs> Faithful in prayer. I tell you, pick up one of these um, um, armbands, something only God can do. They're 
both sides on the front here. We've got a bucket of them. Put them on your arm. Something only God can do. It's the phrase we use here to remind ourselves over and over. I need to be praying. That tension you're feeling, yeah, it's happening um, thousands of times over in this room. We get that. But the only way we're going to work through these things is to be pay- faithful in prayer, to just keep on bringing it before God. I remember a few years ago, I was very frustrated with the situation in my life and a specific person. I was talking to my wife about it. I said, is it going to be all right? I said, are you sure? I said, yeah, guys, I know that person prays. And I'm praying about, they're praying about, be a person that prays about these things. You pray and pray and pray, and you know. And the text goes on to tell us these words, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. When we're a people constantly holding what we have loosely and using it for the good of the kingdom, using it for the good of others, all of a sudden, again, it changes our mindset. If I'm just getting as much as I can for me and for now in my own little kingdom, then that's all I have. And so I grab that and I try to go to the finish line with that. If I go, wait a minute, I have been given all of this to share with others because of the hope And the certainty of what is yet to come, I realize this goes way beyond the finish line. I'm sending this stuff on to eternity. I'm making friends for eternity. I'm investing in people to change their lives for eternity. And it's why I want to give. It's why I want to be a part of that. Showing hospitality, I think this is a lost art in our time. I talk to people all the time because we talk about it oftentimes with groups because I'm always looking for hosts for groups. Would you open up your home to host a group? And they're like, oh yeah, my home's not big enough. My home's not nice enough. We don't have enough furniture. Someday when we buy, I'm going to get a decorator in. And once we get that decorator in, we get that. And then they do that and they go, oh yeah, everything's too nice. I don't want everyone laying all over my furniture. And so there's always this excuse. I'm not a, I'm a great cook. You know, we watch a little too much um, HGTV or H whatever food TV. And um, we were like, yeah, I can't cook. I can't have someone over to the house after church today. Um, yeah, it's going to cost too much to go to a restaurant. We need to be people that are hospitable to each other. We're reaching out. Can you, do you see sort of how we're laying a foundation through all the things that we've spoken of, right? right now for peace. Let me read the verse again. I'm going to put it up on the screen because this is the verse that I want to just be in your head. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Here's the problem. Each one of us have sinful habits. They're sort of learned habits that we've watched maybe our father, how he responded to tension, or our friend or our boss, how they responded when there's tenseness. Um, There's sinful things that, he's like, where'd that come from? And that's how we've learned to deal with the tensions that we have in relationships. And that's why we're behaving the way we are in our marriage. It's why we respond to our boss the way we do. These things we've learned, we've practiced all of our lives. What I've just shared is a list of things that if we were to start implementing them, it would change these responses. But let me throw out a list of those sinful responses. I deny, no, there's no problem. We're fine. I read it something this week. They called that peace faking. I thought that was fascinating. Others of us, it's our preferred method. We just shut down. I'm out. Others of us, we get really harsh. And some of you are married to that person. Others get physical. It just comes out. Some just run. Some of you are running from a relationship. Others is just up. Uh, Go litigate this. Go to the law. Some it's a fight back. Go deliver it back to you as hard as you delivered it to me. Others get loud. Others blame, lie, get even, win at all costs. So, so next week, we're going we're gonna to try to think through some of those, and we're going to start with that. And just the verses right before 1218 and the verses right after 1218 are going to really give us some real biblical parameters how to deal with that when that's our natural response or when someone's coming at us with that with their natural response. I mean, that's the fury that's just really hard to deal with. Today, before we get there, let's, we'll talk about that next week. I hope you come back next week for that.
because this is like a big issue in our lives and we just need, he says here, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We need to figure that out. But for today, let's just think through the things that I can be doing to create a backdrop of peace in my life, a foundation of peace, culture of peace. And let's just take those verses, verses 13 through 15, or nine through 13, I'm sorry, nine through 13, and pick one of those items that we shared a little bit ago. Maybe it's like, I need to work on sacrificial love, disadvantaging myself for someone else. Maybe I need to work on um, looking inside of myself at yuck. Uh, Maybe I need to work at my brotherly love. We have the same father and I need to figure that out. Maybe it's just figuring out how to, I'm just gonna be that person that starts honoring people. Um, Maybe I need to give to some people and just start being a, some of you have the gift of giving and just start blessing other people. Um, showing hospitality. We're just going to start inviting people home every weekend. We're just going to have that culture of hospitality in our home. Whatever, pick one of those and just start going through that this week. I, I mean, some of you are like overachievers. You'll figure out, you'll go through every one of these in the list and you'll probably get discouraged because you can't do it well enough and all that kind of stuff. That's why I just say pick one. Make that the, your thing this week. So this issue of this tension that we have with other people, is sort of the battles that we're in the middle of. It's gonna happen as long as we live here on this earth. So the question is, how are we gonna fight that battle? We're gonna sing a song, this is how I fight that, that my battles. And I would love you to pick one of those things. One of those things in those verses nine through 13. Pick this verse 12, 18. If it has to do with me, we're gonna live at peace. I'm gonna do my best in that. And say, that's how I'm gonna fight my battles. Because we go to the scriptural principle, we follow that scriptural principle. You know what your thing is? You know what it is? Stand up with me. Lord God, we want to fight our battle using your word and your ways, doing it your way.
It may look like I am surrounded, but I am surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. Jesus. You want to get through whatever the issue in your life is, you got to let his gospel penetrate you. You got to let him into your life. It is the only thing that is going to fix the issues of our world, of our governments, of our personal lives, of our marriages. We got to bring Jesus to the center. Christ has to be first. This is how I fight my battles. I want to be surrounded by you, Jesus. The Apostle Paul later on in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16 says these words, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. And so if you think about it for a moment, he says, if any way you can be at peace, do it. But at the end of the day, we depend on him to give you peace. It's going to help. So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray this very verse that Paul wrote. This prayer he wrote, I'm going to pray it over you this morning. So I'm just going to ask you this before I pray that prayer over you. It's dark in this room. You're going through a, a moment of tension. There's someone that you're just, boy, it's struggle. And having peace with them, is, I mean, you wish, but it's, it's ugly. And you just wish there was peace in your life. You wish there was peace in their life. You wish there could be peace between you and them. Just do this for me. I know it, most of us in this room. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray over those of you who have your hand up. Just leave your hand up and keep it up. I'm going to pray these words of Scripture. The Word of God is powerful. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen.